everyone. Thank you so much for watching. If watching, if you're watching on YouTube and listening, if you're listening on the podcast today, I have a truly, truly great guest. Uh, before I introduce him, though, I just have to give a very special shout out to an Instagram follower. Uh, but his name is Jared, but he goes by Celtic Super Collector on Instagram. I'm giving him a shout out because I did an Instagram post here recently where I posted some uh, signed vintage basketball uh, lots that I picked up recently and asked people if they could guess the side PC that I'm going after with the cards that I was showing. And he got it as close as, as possible. And basically, I'm trying to find cards uh, from as many championship teams as possible from the years that they won the championship signed on those cards. So for instance, from like 72, 73 tops that year, the New York Knicks t was the team that won the championship. And so I want to try and find the Busher and, and Willis Reed and Walt Frazier and, and Earl Monroe, all those guys from that team sign on 72, 73 tops cards from that year. So I did that with like 77, 78 Washington Bullets, 78, 79 Seattle Supersonics. I think you get the point. Um, so yeah, he got, he got closest to guessing it right. So giving him a special shout out. So with that in mind and without further ado, I would like to introduce Nick uh, from basketballcardmuseum.com. Basketball um, if you've listened or watched Wax Museum podcast, um, you've, you've seen Nick on his show or you've listened to Nick on his show before. Nick really has an interest in the history of basketball cards and basketball card design. So I wanted to ask him on to talk about his website and his interest in basketball cards in general. So Nick, thank you so much for joining us. I really appreciate you taking the time to do this. Thanks for having me. Really appreciate it. Yeah. So where did this interest start with you when it comes to basketball card sets and designs? What is, what is your history with that? Yeah. I mean, I think um, I was like a lot of people, I was a collector back in the early nineties and through early two thousands um, and then sort of picked it back up during the pandemic. And I got deep back into it when I, uh, returned. Um, and in particular, I really decided to focus on the cards that I loved collecting the most. And, um, yeah, I'm a visual designer by trade, um, and user experience designer. So, um, the cards that I really enjoyed the aesthetics of were a lot of those 1970s top sets, like especially 71, 72, uh, 74, just like the bright, bold colors, and you have the wacky haircuts and um, the beautiful typography. And I just fell in love with those sets. And I figured, hey, why not just like really focus on that for a while? Uh, and that led to um, my first sort of project over the last few, year, a few years, which is called Basketballers, B A W L E R S. It's an Instagram account where I just sort of make up legends and lore about uh, this, this era. Um, sort of inspired by that book, Loose Balls, about the ABA, yeah. um, but also uh, expanding into NBA characters as well. Um, and then more recently, I've really been focused on this project, the Basketball Card Museum, um, because uh, I found an interest in global basketball cards, not just um, cards from the United States. So I started building what I call the typeset collection. Um, and the idea of a typeset comes from the industry of like uh, coin collecting or the hobby of coin collecting. Um, I used to have this typeset binder that I built as a kid. And the idea is that you collect an example of every different set that exists within certain parameters. So um, I hadn't seen anything like this done in the basketball card collecting world. And I said, why not give it a shot? So I started with um, the parameters of like a US focused type typeset collection uh, up through 1990. Cause after 1990, there's just too many sets. It just like the hobby exploded, but uh, I really enjoyed that older stuff. And since then I've expanded the focus of that to be uh, global as well. Yeah. I uh, saw that typeset project you did on wax museum podcast channel. It was very cool. Very interesting to see the complete history of what you put together with your parameters of basketball cards going back to the beginning of time, essentially, and going up to, to 1990. A lot of cool stuff. We'll hit into some of those things specifically here in a minute. So so that, so that started your interest in doing the website. So can you talk about the, crea the creation of the website for a little bit and what are what 
I mean, I, I, from what I've seen on the site, it, you're literally trying to upload pretty much everything you can find of, of, of an example of all the basketball cards that have ever basically existed, correct? That's right. That's right. So I know a lot of people try to hyper focus on either collecting one specific player and getting every card of them or other people want to collect a complete set. Um, for me, especially since I don't have like a huge budget, I know I'm not one of those collectors who can drop, you know, $10,000 on a PSA 10 autograph of, you know, Jordan or something like that. But um, I am much more interested in in the breadth of, uh, of the hobby. And um, it's been an interesting challenge trying to like, first of all, identify and then track down examples of some of these really niche sets that are out there. Um, most of the ones within the U.S. have been a little easier to track down, uh, just more information available. But when I started building that first version of the typeset, I came across a couple examples of international sets that I just thought were really cool and underappreciated. I think the hobby tends to have a very like U.S. centric approach in general. So I really enjoyed stepping back and trying to track down some of these global sets. And the more um, the more that I found, the more I got into it and just love doing the research and connecting with some of these um, international collectors. Like just last week, I was messaging with somebody from Germany who helped me identify two or three sets that were missing um, from like the 1950s and before. So it's been a lot of fun finding these kind of pockets of basketball history uh, throughout the world and where there was little sort of uh, sort of interest that you wouldn't expect, for instance, uh, in the Philippines, as far back as, uh, you know, World War uh, One, there was interest in basketball uh, that I found recently because the U.S. troops were playing demonstration games out there. And then um, people from the Philippines, like, picked it up and ran with it. And th there's a huge following to this day. Um, or in uh, Yugoslavia or what's formerly known as Yugoslavia, which is now um, a few countries, including Croatia and Serbia, um, we saw basketball really take a huge um, growth in popularity, like during the 1980s and even 70s. Um, and to this day, there's still tons of great basketball players coming out from that region. But it's so fun yeah. to find these little pockets and, and eras where you have like a surprising amount of really cool basketball card sets. And I've tried to document all that to the best of my abilities on the website um, in recent times. It's really interesting what I've learned. Um, even just recently, I was just talking to somebody who uh, told me that he found these uh, 1950s uh, Japanese pogs mm. of uh, American athletes, included uh, Otto Graham, and it also included like George Mikan. Yeah, it's like they don't they don't specifically name George Mikan, but it, you can tell it's his image. It's a basketball player with glasses. One. Yeah, yeah I, I was like, I didn't know that those existed. That's really interesting. So it's 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 really cool to have sort of a centralized database of just yeah. about everything that you can think of that that would literally ex has ever existed when it comes to basketball cards. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I found like you know, for instance, trading trading card database does a great job of trying to track down a lot of these sets, but. Um, it was the most complete resource that I could find to get a head start on trying to identify a lot of different sets from around the world. Um, but they were missing a lot as well. And um, I've already submitted uh, a couple sets that I've tracked down uh, to TC uh, DB for them to help fill in some gaps. But um, yeah, as you get into these more niche foreign sets, it's really hard to track down information. And when you do, it's usually a blog that was uh, written by somebody who's First language is in English, so a lot of times I was using like you know Google Translate or something like that to help me figure out a lot of the information that I tried to fill in, um, fill in the gaps in the collecting world. Cool. Well, let's talk about a few specific things. What in your research that you've done would you say is probably most likely the first basketball card that ever existed? That's a great question. Um, so. First basketball card that ever existed. It's a little controversial, but uh, I would go with the 1899 Enameline shoe polish card. Um, it's not a rectangular basketball card in the traditional sense, but it is printed on cardboard. It represents, um, there's like a figure on the front and it's sort of this like strange looking child holding a, it's an illustration of a child holding a basketball. And um, on the back, there's like, sort of a uh, promo for this shoe polish company, but it's so cool to hold something <laughs> from the 1800s. And um, 
I think that's probably the very first example. Other people would go with, uh, depends on how specific you get, right? Is it like the first specific basketball player on there? Because then you get into right. like the sports Kings set, which is like decades later. Um, with the first full basketball card dedicated set, of course, is the 48 Bowman set. Um, right, right. In the US. Um, so there's lots of different milestones that you can look at. But I think that 1899 card is the one that really... Uh, for me is is the very first. Yeah, and I think I think a lot of people would probably think of the 1933, uh, the Sports King cards, the four, I think there were four in that set, right? Um, yeah. That's kind of the first basketball cards. But in your research, you've found quite a few things prior to 1933, it looks like. What are some of the other sort of interesting uh, 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 stuff you found right. prior to 1933 that many people may not be familiar with? Um. Let's see. Yeah. So some other sets that I've found um, prior to yeah, those sets from the 30s that are a little more familiar. So, for instance, I've tracked down some from Spain um, is one picturing this like wooden basket, uh, wooden backboard with like um, very early looking like game of basketball happening. And some of these sets I still don't have a ton of information on other than the um general decade ideally down to a couple year window um sometimes they're also just like little promo cards that were part of toys so i have this one from italy that i'm pretty sure tracks to the 1920s or early 30s um so yeah. still a lot of a lot of mysteries a lot of gaps to fill in but that's what's cool about connecting with other collectors who might have more of a local perspective and information to provide yeah and what was the year that Murad had a couple of just basic basketball game cards or whatever. What year was that again? Oh, yeah. I think it was either 1910 or 1912. I had to double-check yeah. my, my checklist. But I love the, right. um, there's those felts that they created as well. Yeah. And, um, they're like tiny rugs. And apparently people used to put them in like dollhouses and stuff like that. But they're very collectible and weird, cool little illustrations of um, different athletes from different colleges on there as well. So. Yeah, 1910, I believe, is, is also a year. Yeah. We saw a lot of cool stuff. Yep. All right, so uh, getting into, you know, I suppose, post-1933. So what are some of the sets that you still gravitate towards the most in terms of being some of your favorite in terms of design or just some of your favorites in terms of the backstory, uh, history of those sets? And we can we can stop... We can go up to like 1970, stop there, and then we can talk about the 70s afterwards because I know you're a big, huge 70s, uh, <laughs> 70s fan on, on pretty huge much all the basketball. Fan. Yeah, for sure. Um, let's see. So um, a couple that I would go with, uh, the Topps Magic Photos set from the 1940s. Um, these are cards that they're only about an inch by an inch and a half, and um, it's – well, over a decade before people think of the first Topps basketball card set, um, mm -hmm. Topps produced a multi-sport set of these little self-exposing photographs. It's almost like how a Polaroid picture works, but you would expose them to the sun and then the image shows up over time. Um, I think these are really cool. Uh, I'm surprised that they're not sort of more sought after and they're relatively affordable to find on eBay as well. Um, so that's one of my favorites, just as far as something that's really interesting and different um yeah and that's then, a good one yeah 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 um let's see into the to the 50s oh man there's there's a lot of cool sets coming out of france in the 50s a lot of chocolate companies and cafes i found that were producing these like really odd black and white basketball card sets um oh, really but, uh one that i also really liked was um I, I haven't been able to confirm the exact year, but I think it's from 1950. There are these tiny um, cards from Yugoslavia that are black and white um, with sort of handwritten typography on them. And um, they're really interesting. Uh, most of the cards seem to track to the team uh, um, Red Star Bel Belgrade, I believe they're called. Um, but that's a really, that's a bizarre one too. There's some photos in there that I just love. I can't afford most of the cards, but I managed to track down one example, so um mm -hmm. that's a fun one as well um, there's so many there's so many fun oddball stuff that you can find in the 50s and 60s mm -hmm. and you know re regional sets like obviously like the the jack-in-the-box sets from 68 which i really like um and then like the 
the Wonder Bread, <laughs> um, those, those things they put. I don't even know. Like they're kind of cards, but kind of not. I don't know. They're they're interesting. And uh, of course, one of my personal favorites are is like the sixty eight tops test set that no, never many people knew about until like the nineties. And they started finally getting sneaked out of the tops headquarters, or whatever. And they're still really rare and really hard to find, yeah. but just really fascinating in terms of the history of, 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 the, of those cards. Oh, those are neat as well. Also, just yeah. thinking about the 50s, this um, set called Heinerly, 1958 Heinerly, Heinerly from Germany. Uh, there's a couple early Harlem Globetrotters cards that are in there. And it's really interesting as I started doing more research to see how often Globetrotters cards show up. Um, I think now they're not maybe taking quite as seriously as a, a basketball team, but um, dating like back to the 50s, 60s, 70s, they were hugely influential, uh, had a big presence around the world. And they're some of the most common trading cards to show up of this era. So um, pretty cool to see Curly Neal and um, a couple of these other like legendary Harlem Globetrotters uh, players show up in, in international sets. Absolutely. All right, well, let's take a few minutes and talk about the 70s and some of your favorite sets and designs of the 70s and some other interesting oddball sets from that time period. So have at it. What what are some oh, of your man. favorites? Yeah, <laughs> so these are just the best. So many cool colors, great <laughs> typography, ridiculous, just uh, personal aesthetics going on too with the hairstyles and the sideburns and all that. Um, I think, you know, some of the top sets are my personal favorites. So the 1972 tops, 19... 19- uh, 74 tops. Also the jumbo, like 76 tops cards are so cool. Um, love all these. Uh, and I, these are, these are sets that I try to collect more than just one example of, I'm trying to, um, get the full collection of most of these if possible. Um, also some of the oddball sets from this era, a lot of the, um, disc sets. So, um, this company MSA produced a bunch of these, illustrated discs that were then sold uh, to other companies. So for instance, Crane Potato Chips or Carvel Ice Cream um, have uh, very identical looking sets, but um, there's one that I have posted with like Phil Jackson with the cool, ridiculous 70s hairstyle before he came <laughs> up a little bit, or um, there's some beautiful ones of any, if you like any players from that era, these are really collectible, surprisingly affordable um have all the fun colors and typography going on as well yeah um, but yeah big fan of those and um what year was Comspec? was that 72 that's 72 yeah. yeah yeah that's a good one those are those are hard to come by for sure usually um a little out of my price range but i actually had a collector um donate one of those a while back to me to help fill out the set so that was very generous yeah, what's the story on those? And they and didn't they did they use the uh, the sixty eight tops images for their for their set? Well, what year was it that they? Did? Um, they actually used the the seventy two uh, tops tops images. But they're identical, yeah. and um, there's only thirty six cards in the set, so it's a very small subset of that collection. But those are those are a lot of fun as well. And they were a one and done. It was a company that showed up in California and then that was that was it. They tried and they came, they saw, they flopped and moved on. But it makes uh, for some fun collectibles they, now. They tried with a 38 card set. I like I don't know what they were thinking. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I'll battle for sure. Yeah. They just, yeah, oh, and, probably um, just ran out of money. Yeah. No, it's true. One other fun one. Barely counts as a card, but I, I like to add it in there is the 1971 Mattel instant replay discs, um, <laughs> which are basically tiny little records um, that played like a, a clip of like some highlight reels of the different athletes. And um, there was like a tiny little cassette kind of player dedicated just for these uh, instant replay discs. And those are also relatively affordable online. I have one of Pete Maravich posted the, to the collection. <laughs> and then... Um... Icy Bear, remind me, what year was was the Icy Bear set again? Was it seventy four? Um, was that seventy four, seventy six? Maybe seventy six. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think it was a little bit later. Yeah, um, love that. Oh, seventy two actually. It was earlier. Yeah, okay. that, that's also one where I have the Pete Maravich card posted, and I love the photos on these. Uh, the Pete Maravich has this like dramatic, you know, cloudy sky background. It looks very surrealist. 
And there's also one of uh, Wes Unseld in that set that I think really looks cool. It looks like, like a, a poster. It's very just like it, he's got that 70s uh, bullets uniform on and it's just looking very serious into the camera. Those are some of my favorite photographs from that set for sure. Yeah. You talked about your uh, parameters for for what constitutes as a card. Some of those, like the icy bear cards, come dangerously close to being a little oversized. What is sort of the size per, uh, parameter that you use uh, to differentiate what's a card as opposed to like something larger, like a postcard or a poster or whatever? Yeah, for sure. Um, for me, six by eight is sort of the max for a card. Like. I've seen things that are considered cards that are larger than that. And it doesn't sound too large, six by eight, but if you hold the card that size, you're like, that's a huge basketball <laughs> card. Um, on trading card database and other resources, there's some stuff that is considered like a basketball card that measures up to, I think, eight by 10 or 11 by 14. But I think that's a little, little overkill. Yeah. Yeah. Eight by 10 for sure. seems way too big. Um, Okay, so going into the 80s and, and all the way up to the late 80s or uh, 1990, so what are some of the ones that stand out to you from that era, whether it's uh, the uh, stuff done here in America or stuff done overseas? Um, good question. So let's see. Um, it's interesting in this era to try to track down other international sets. So, um you know, Panini was really big through the 60s, 70s, and 80s, making a lot of sticker sets. People think of them as just popping up recently, but they've, they've been at it for a long time, making multi-sport sticker sets. Um, so they do some cool stuff. But there's also some really just niche oddball stuff also in these eras that I get a kick out of. Um, I'm trying to think, what would be my favorite? One that I really appreciate. So uh, Foot Locker sponsored this event called the Slam Fest, where um, athletes from other sports would compete in a dunk contest. And they did this for like, I think three or four years. So you have um, all these like players that are not traditionally represented in basketball. Like there's this picture I have of a, um, a volleyball player with like a really terrible late eighties high top <laughs> going on, um, holding a basketball and trying to look cool and very unsuccessfully doing so. Um, yeah. Those are fun Who's that? Yeah. Who's that volleyball player's name again? Do you remember? Um, who is that guy? Steve Timmons. Yeah, wasn't he? I'm pretty sure. Wasn't he uh, married to Jeannie Buss at one point? Ooh, that's a that's a good deep cut fact. I'll have to I, verify. I'm that. pretty. I'm, sure. I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure that's the same guy. I remember she was married to like some professional volleyball player like no back in, back before she was dating Phil Jackson. You know, I can't remember that's the exact funny. years, but. Yeah, I saw that. I was like, well, there you go. There's, I guess, the reason they did that. I don't know, but whatever. Um, cool. Well, I'll tell you what. I've always been very partial to, like, the star cards of, of the mid-'80s. Um, yeah. I still really like the Fleer sets, of course. Uh, 87 Fleer is actually the, my personal favorite. A lot of attention gets uh, put on 86 Fleer, which I, I get. It's, it's, it's fine. Uh, <laughs> I actually kind of like the look of 87 a little bit better. Um, and then, yeah, like you said, kind of after 1990, just then it's just there's too many sets and, and too many companies uh, producing cards and so true. And things get more and more saturated. So it's yeah, it'd be it'll be almost impossible to do a database of anything past 1990. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It gets it gets kind of exhausting past 1990. There's also so many um, insert sets and parallels. And it's also just more well-documented. So I didn't really feel like I was adding a whole lot by continuing the collection past 1990. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to uh, also make sure, were there, were there any other sets um, that you've discovered here recently while doing uh, research on this that you know, international sets in particular that just have stood out to you and things that just you found really fascinating, uh, both from a historical or from a design standpoint? Um, yeah, I appreciate it. So, oh, there's so many, it's hard to pick, but um, I think um, some of my favorites are also anything from South America in like Argentina, I found some really great sets. So there's, um, these discs that I found um, from the 1950s that are really beautiful and really hard to track down. Argentina, I found, is one of the harder places to source cards from, but um, I recommend checking out the page of cards from, from Argentina because there's some great ones in there. Um, I think overall my takeaway is just like 
expand your search a little bit, like check out some of these sets. Don't fall into the usual sort of most sought after um, cards that a lot of people are chasing because there's some just beautiful stuff out there from all around the world. And um, some of it's shockingly affordable. Um, I'd love to discover more cards from um, Asia. Um, if I, you know, if there's any listeners uh, on your show who are interested in um, connecting with me, I'd really love to track down some. Um, you mentioned that Menko uh, disc card from the 1950s that had a uh, image of George Mikan on there. That's like on my bucket list for sure. That one's very hard to come across, but um, there's only a couple sets that I've been able to track down pre-1990 from from Asia. So if anybody knows of any that I'm missing, uh, I'd love to to connect. Why why do you think there there were so many different strange or oddball things coming out of different countries for basketball? And I know they do this for other sports as well. Um, I mean, do you, because mm. when people think about the popularity of the game of basketball overseas, they think about it kind of starting maybe around the mid eighties, but definitely sort of uh, culminating with like the 92 dream team team. And then, and then everyone was like, Oh, well then there's basketball fever across the globe, but there's so many of these strange and interesting sets that have existed well before the mid eighties. So do you think it was simply a lot of countries just trying to uh, get in on American consumerism and uh, tourism money uh, with these type of deals? Or do you think there was like legit interest in uh, these professional leagues uh, mm -hmm. in many of these countries across the globe during these time periods? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, short answer is yes, there was legitimate interest throughout the world uh, of basketball dating back pretty far in some cases. Um, I think, uh, most of the sets that I have posted that are, you know, before the, the 40s and 50s um, are not dedicated basketball card sets. So a lot of them are multi-sports sets or sets in particular that often feature more uh, soccer cards. But um, basketball had its following in different pockets throughout the world. And, you know, they weren't looking to sell these to international collectors or anything like that. It was for a local audience for sure. And I think the history is really unique to each different place. I mean, some I've been able to track down some of the stories. Um, but for instance, you know, in the Philippines, like I mentioned earlier, it was uh, some of the soldiers that were playing there um, were demonstrating the game. And then um, Filipino people picked it up and ran with it. And it was really cool to see, you know, a separate basketball culture grow there. Uh, honestly, it was bigger there arguably than it was in the US by the time that the NBA rolled around. So that was kind of cool to think about. Um, also places like uh, Spain, um, my understanding is that the Olympics, uh, when the Spanish Olympic team competed at a pretty high level against the US, and you know, people got to see um, their people like Michael Jordan playing against their hometown heroes. And suddenly there was this like huge renewed interest and passion around the sport of basketball in Spain. So there's actually tons of sets from Spain, uh, especially in the 1980s that uh, have popped up that I've been able to track down. So I think each place has its own history and reason for why people got into the game at the time that they did there. But um, yeah, it's been, it's been global for a while. And um, I think, you know, it's obviously now reflected within the, the build of who's within the NBA, but there's been fans of basketball uh, all around the world for, for a long, long time. Well, that's really cool to hear. Um, yeah, very, very interesting to know about just so many things that have existed for a really long time period, even longer than what I think most people expect. Um, and, you know, nowadays, um, everything, even international stuff is so licensed and manufactured and all that stuff of course and you just you won't really ever find sort of these interesting oddball items across the globe like you used to back in the day of like the 40s 50s and 60s and so yeah i definitely i'm definitely fascinated by it and i definitely recommend anyone uh, who might be interested in this to to go to your website and take a look and or go to your instagram um, I'll definitely post those links below. Um, is there anything else you want to make sure to mention um, in terms of things that you've been uh, discovering lately or just other ways of uh, reaching out to you uh, if someone wants to reach out to you about uh, things that you, you may need more information about or whatever? Yeah, thanks. Um, 
I've definitely found that I've been able to fill in a lot of gaps by connecting with people. So as you're checking out the website, if you see anything that looks inaccurate, let me know. There's a contact form right on the on the website. Um, also, if you see anything that you think is missing, like if you know of a niche Australian basketball card set from the 1960s that I don't have in there, like I'd <laughs> love to know about it. Um, I will say I'm not looking for team specific sets because those get too regional and there's just too many of them. But anything that has um, multiple teams on it and is before 1990 is something that is definitely of interest to me. Um, also, I have an Instagram account where I'm trying to post an, a different set each day. So for people who are more active on social media, that can be helpful. It's also under Basketball Card Museum. Um, same thing there, though, if you see anything that's missing or feels inaccurate, uh, I'd love to know. In some cases, I'm just missing things like checklists. Another thing, in other cases, you know, I have a general sense of what year a card's from, but I haven't been able to confirm. Um, sometimes I also just love hearing backstories on certain manufacturers or certain players that are represented in the cards. It's really cool to be able to source that from other collectors. So um, share what you know, and I hope that you uh, find something on there that you're interested in. Um, I haven't met anybody who hasn't discovered at least one new set, if not lots of new sets, by checking out this website. Um, so uh, you'll be the first if you've seen all of these, for sure. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Nick, once again. And that was basketballcardmuseum.com. Um, like I said, I'll post links below in the description. Uh, I really appreciate you taking the time to do this interview. Thanks for having me. It's been fun. Yep. Thank you. Take care.